and welcome to Counting the Cost. I'm Stephen Cole, coming up on your weekly look at the world of business and finance. Mining gold in Mali, a military coup, an armed uprising, an insurgency, and yet Mali's economy has held up pretty well. It's Africa's third biggest producer of gold. And this week we look at the role it plays in Mali's economic survival. Also this week, a disputed election win for Robert Mugabe's party, but his pledge to increase black economic empowerment has investors on edge. And the wrong type of jobs. As Obama promises a middle class a better bargain, people are saying, forget the promise, just give us some jobs. But first, an ethnic Tuareg uprising, a military coup and an Islamist insurgency. To say it's been a tough year for Mali would be an understatement. The nation was almost split in half by the insurgency, but French and pan-African forces restored enough stability to enable elections to take place. As voters go to the polls for presidential runoff, Mali's $10.4 billion economy could get a big boost from international donors, but they're promising $4 billion in aid only if there are peaceful elections held. Despite all the trouble and promises of more help, Mali's economy has got off lightly. The economy contracted only 1.5% in 2012, according to the World Bank. Most of the good fortune has to do with gold. The country is Africa's third biggest producer, and gold represents 80% of export earnings. The economy may expand 5% this year because gold producers in the west of the country have been unaffected. Most of those gold miners are based in the west of the country. There are currently seven mines operating in Mali. The big players are Angla Gold and Rand Gold Resources. Mali also has an abundance of other minerals, including diamonds and uranium. But there's also younger, nimbler explorers in the territory, such as Mark Connolly, chief executive of Papillon Resources, and he joins me now from Perth in Western Australia. Mark, has it been a challenge with all the troubles the country has faced? For example, the military coup in the north, the uprising, the insurgency, unsettling to say the least. From our own perspective, we've uh, seen no interruption with the, the way that we've been able to get our work done. Um, of course, you know, uh, some, some you know, issues around security and uh, the safety of our people is always paramount. Um, so we have increased um, a presence around uh, using uh, security or increasing the security and, and the way we, we obviously move our people and our assets um, uh, within the, the workspace or the area that we're in. We uh, will do that um, obviously during daylight hours and we, we keep a fairly low profile with our people, um, you know, driving at night for example. But um, overall we've actually been very happy and it's been very, uh, you know, constructive work that we've been able to do. How do you manage the expectations of your investors in a situation like this? I, I take it they're, they're a hardy bunch. The typical response I have for the investors is if you look at our, our industry, which is the gold industry in Mali and the, the significant um, percentage of the country's GDP that it provides and the tax receipts uh, to the government, I think that that's a, a testament to, to why the industry has continued to grow and flourish in the last few years. Um, many of the, the major gold mining companies in the world operate in Mali. Um, there are a number of mid-tier companies operating as well. Um, and for us, as, as, as our own company, Papillon Resources, we're, um, we're an emerging producer and um, you know, we're very happy to, to you know, demonstrate to our investors that we can get you know, things done and business as usual, evident by the fact that we've just received our environmental permits um, uh, only awarded to us in the last month or so by the government. We're in the mining license permit uh, application process. So, you know, from all indications that we have and all my discussions with the government to date, I mean, they've been very receptive to seeing investment and very receptive to seeing new projects coming online. So it's not difficult to raise funding then, uh, because there are miners who are turning to hedging as the gold price levelled off and now falls? You know, for our own company, we're, we're certainly well funded at this current point and, um, and that's on the back of a, a capital raising we did back in March of 2013, which was uh, oversubscribed, which was a, a very pleasing aspect. 
Um, we see uh, there is still appetite, obviously, with investors around quality projects. Um, and obviously, we present, I think, a very you know, worthwhile and quality project um, that we have in, in Mali. Um, good management. I think we've been able to secure some good management and, and experienced management as well. From, from our own perspective, we're, we're certainly confident of being able to secure funding um, for our project as we go through the development phase. How would you assess the potential of your sites? I'm often asked that question and, and typically, you know, as most CEOs or managing directors would say, there's always that, that significant upside. Um, I, you know, I seriously believe that we have, without doubt, what we would say is one of the best undeveloped gold assets in, in certainly in West Africa and if not, um, you know, in the, in the gold space on a global basis. Um, we have lots of potential. Um, we, we have probably explored 20% of our current uh, mineral concession or our concession. Um, and within that concession, you know, we have another sort of 70 to 80% of, of further exploration. Uh, we see, you know, lots of upside. We see lots of potential to add to our resource base. Um, and doing work, as I've earlier said, in Mali, um, people are available, equipment's available, and, um, you know, we're funded to be able to continue with that exploration work that we intend to do. At what point will it become uncompetitive to mine for gold? The current price is about $1,200 an ounce. If you look at our uh, feasibility study or pre-feasibility study, I should say, that we just released to the market uh, at the end of June, our cash costs uh, are sub $600. So we certainly have a fair bit of headroom um, uh, within uh, our cash cost profile to where the current gold price is. Um, and our all up, what I call our business cost, is, is still sub $750 an ounce. So um, on that metric um, for a $1,200 gold price, we still have a, a quite a nice margin, um, certainly for our project. And, um, you know, I remain quite, you know, bullish on the gold price. Um, so I think, um, you know, uh, we, we certainly have the capacity to go um, to a lower gold price, but obviously, um, you know, and that's all dependent on how we can produce it. But, I, you know, based on the, the economics and the work that we've done, we, we're certainly within a, a very nice cost quartile for, uh, for the Focola project. For Mali, this is a significant export earner. And for the people of Mali, that would bring prospect of jobs. So how many people do you think you can provide jobs for? There's probably two phases of the, the sort of the employment cycle. One is obviously through the construction phase and we would see up to maybe, you know, 800 to 1,000 jobs at the peak or the height of our construction. Um, but in, in steady state operations, we would be looking somewhere between 300 to 400 on a permanent basis um, on the payroll. So I think, you know, that's a, a significant, you know, employer and obviously a significant contributor to the, to the country. I mean, our project um, has the potential to be the largest gold producing uh, gold mine in Mali. Um, based on the figures that we see today, we'll be producing over 320, 330,000 ounces annually. Mali's annual production is about uh, 1.2 to 1.3 million ounces. So, you know, this project is, is you know, very significant within the context of the, the country and within the context of that production profile. Mark Connolly, Chief Executive of Papillon Resources, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And still ahead on counting the cost. Five years on from the financial crisis, the US is creating jobs, but it's the wrong kind of jobs. Will President Obama be able to keep his promise of a more prosperous middle class? A post-election promise from Robert Mugabe's ZANU-PF party was splashed right across newspapers right across the country. It said that last week's election win was an endorsement of its plan for black economic empowerment. But as Haru Mutasa reports from Harare, many investors are worried that the plan appears to target foreign-owned companies. The smelling company produces 45 tonnes of flour and 75 tonnes of mealy meal a day, a staple food in Zimbabwe. It's one of many black-owned companies that emerged after the government's indigenization policy was introduced. The law requires foreign-owned firms to give 51% of shares to black Zimbabweans. At the end of the day, what we are really worried about are banks uh, giving us lines of credit. And as you can actually see, it's business as usual. Nothing has really changed on the ground. 
It's just people who are scared, but at the end of the day, we want stability, and I think this government will actually give us that. President Robert Mugabe's election victory has raised fears Zimbabwe's economy could be in for another bumpy ride. His own repair party won a two-thirds majority in parliament. Concerns about the party's dominance saw the nation's stock index fall. There's no longer any appetite and any hope of a market rising, especially when you know that the major controllers of the market, who are the foreign investors, are quite very afraid of the unfriendly and expropriatory policies, which have been quite very hawkish in terms of the approach uh, to investment. After more than a decade of economic decline, most industries are still operating at below 50% capacity. Most Zimbabweans aren't formally employed, and this is how they make ends meet, selling whatever they can to feed their families. Zanu PF officials say they will increase black ownership of the economy in the next five years, targeting foreign-owned companies, including banks and mines. Mugabe's party has set its eyes on more than 1,000 foreign-owned firms, and that's making investors even more nervous. Haru Mutasa, Al Jazeera. Harare. Well, to China now, because the country has banned baby milk imports from New Zealand, and as a result, demand has risen for similar products from other countries. People don't trust local Chinese products because of a baby milk scandal involving counterfeit milk powder in 2008. And as Rob McBride reports, there's now a flourishing trade in smuggling milk from Hong Kong to the mainland. In the towns along the border between Hong Kong and mainland China, a buying frenzy. The suspiciously high number of pharmacies do a roaring trade in well-known Western brands of baby milk formula. With schools and colleges out for the summer, young people from both sides of the border can make some holiday money, making multiple trips with two tins of baby milk powder per journey. Pretending to be a student, our researcher went with a hidden camera to find out how it's done. This is the brand they're after, the man behind the counter tells us helpfully. Just walk across the border with the tins in a plastic bag and the middlemen will approach you, he says. What worries the authorities is not one or two cans of baby formula being carried across per person, but the wholesale smuggling that is now thought to be flourishing here. It adds to the resentment by Hong Kong residents to the influx of mainland visitors who are perceived as being all-consuming. Leung Kum Xing's views are typical of many here, organizing campaigns against the traders. The trade is making it harder for local people. One store was forced to shut because the landlord wanted to rent the premises for four times as much to a new pharmacy. For some Hong Kong residents, the continued flow of baby formula north nurtures not only mainland Chinese, but also the growing resentment of them. Rob McBride, Al Jazeera, Hong Kong. It's almost five years now since the North Atlantic financial crisis. The trouble began in the U.S. housing market with the implosion of subprime mortgage market. Bankers and brokers were selling on bad debt, quite simply. Now Barack Obama says he has a new plan aimed at boosting the recovery of the country's housing sector. The US president called for a series of reforms for both borrowers and lenders. Patty Culhane takes a look at what the changes could mean for American homeowners. US President Barack Obama on tour again, this time a construction company in Phoenix, Arizona, trying to highlight what he calls the recovery of the housing market. He's been here before, four years ago, his first pitch to help homeowners. Through this plan, we will help between seven and nine million families. Now he's back. Same region, different backdrop, but even the White House now admits their programs have helped far fewer people than planned, only around three million homeowners. He didn't mention that part. We helped millions of Americans save an average of $3,000 each year by refinancing at lower rates. We helped millions of responsible homeowners stay in their homes. Would but not always for the long term. In one of the programs he's talking about, named HAMP, internal reports show 1.2 million Americans modified their mortgages, but more than 306,000 still defaulted. 26% likely lost their homes anyway. Now the president is calling for the hardest hit states to get more federal money. Now places that are, that are facing a, a longer road back from the crisis should have their country's help. Uh, to, to get back on their feet. But they already have that program, and of the $7.6 billion his administration could spend, they've spent just about a third of it, $2.7 billion. Mary Hunter works to keep people in their homes. While she says the federal programs have helped, 
the problem in her county, just outside of Washington, D.C., their homes are worth less than what they owe. They call it being underwater. Half of the homeowners in Prince George's County are underwater. Um, we see 100 new homeowners each month. Almost all the homeowners that we work with are underwater, significantly. We're talking $100,000. Rising home prices will help that problem eventually. President Barack Obama is promising the federal government will do more now. He made that promise before. The figures show he kept it for some. Patty Culhane, Al Jazeera, Washington. Of course, a major factor in any housing recovery is a recovery in the jobs market. If people aren't working, they're not going to buy a new house or even try and trade up the property ladder. And on the face of it, the news looks good for American employment. The unemployment rate is slowly falling and jobs are being created. But are they the right kind of jobs? According to analysts from investment bank Westwood Capital, nearly 70% of jobs created during the second quarter of this year were in the lowest paid sector. As an example, fast food jobs in New York City earn an average salary of $11,000 a year, and that's less than half the national average of all workers. Since April, there have been numerous protests by fast food workers as employees in several cities take to the streets to demand a living wage. And that comes as President Obama stresses the need for good jobs and a, quote, better bargain for the middle classes. So what's gone wrong and how can this imbalance be corrected? Well, Ian Shepherdson is chief economist at Pantheon Macroeconomics and he joins me from Singapore. Uh, Ian, it's now almost five years since the financial crisis. Unemployment hasn't begun to recover from pre-crisis levels. Uh, the jobs being created, the few of them that are being created, are mostly low-income uh, jobs. Why is that? The economy is still suffering very much from the after-effects of the financial crash. And if we look at other economies that have suffered similar crashes in the past, there's not many, but there's been a few, it tends to take four or five years minimal for normality to return. And I do think that the US is heading in the right direction on that score, and I'm encouraged by some of the recent labor market numbers, but the picture's still very uneven. Uh, the banking system is now helping the economy rather than hindering it, and that's a huge step in the right direction. But I think a lot of the wounds have not yet fully healed over, and it's going to take probably another year before we get really fully up to speed. If we take a look at Detroit, now this is a city that grew uh, from a single industry. Well, it's unlikely that kind of growth will happen again from one industry, isn't it? But is it a big warning light on the US fiscal uh, dashboard, so to speak? I don't think it is. I think Detroit's a very special case because of the collapse of the auto industry, which was a long, long, painful decline. Though actually now, of course, after the bailouts in 08 and 09, the US automakers, although they're a lot smaller, are very profitable and generating huge amounts of cash again. But they will not generate or regenerate Detroit's downtown. That's going to be a job that takes generations and it'll be very long and very painful. And the legacy financial implications for the city uh, will take a great deal of sorting out. But Detroit is not indicative of the US economy as a whole. Uh, there are very many places that are still troubled, but nothing quite on that scale. And of course, one of the great things about the US is the way that it tends to reinvent itself in every cycle. So where the growth will be coming from in the next cycle, I can't be sure, just as nobody would have predicted Amazon.com 20 years ago. These things have a habit of growing organically, and the way the US is structured allows these things to happen very quickly and very efficiently in a way that we don't see in many other places. But you still, in order to get those good things happening, you need to have a fully functioning banking system. System. You need to have a restoration of the usual credit flows that keep things growing. You need to have confidence in the business sector, especially the small business sector. And you need to have certainty over policy. And the US doesn't have that because Congress is squabbling with itself yet again over fiscal policy. And that's making me very nervous. Well, Republicans believe you can get back on the road to recovery without raising taxes. Is that possible? Well, you can get back on the road to recovery in terms of economic growth. Uh, whether you can get on the road to full fiscal health in the medium term without raising taxes is another question altogether. 
Now, the Republicans, remember, are split, though. This is not a, a uniform bloc. We have the Tea Party, who are extremely vociferous on never raising taxes again under any circumstances. But there's another group of Republicans who are a bit more uh, persuadable. And, of course, they did raise taxes, those uh, more persuadable Republicans, back in January. And whether they'll do it again anytime soon, I think, is very unlikely. And so we're going to have an enormous fight in this coming autumn as Congress backs, gets back from its summer recess and has to deal with the budget for 2014 and beyond. So. Um, it's going to be a very messy and very uncomfortable autumn, but I, I fingers crossed we'll get out of it with a deal which sees us through the next year and hopefully uh, doesn't do too much damage to the economy in the meantime. If, Ian, we take a look at, shall we say, the Anglo-Saxon uh, speaking uh, nations, the uh, UK and the United States, we're seeing a trend where the low income workers in particular are being squeezed, whether that's zero-hour contracts or jobs in the fast food and the retail industries. What needs to change there in those industries if the recovery really is going to take a grip? Well, these companies that are paying people uh, on these very low incomes and, and restricting them to these zero-hour contracts are already sort of shooting themselves in the foot because their prime customers are receiving, at the moment, falling pay increases in real terms. So one of the big problems in the Anglo economies uh, is a desperate shortage of consumer cash flow. Now, of course, at the peak of the boom, cash flow is much less important because people were borrowing against the value of their homes and spending that money. Well, they can't do that anymore, and that's not coming back anytime soon. So the consumer sector is now heavily constrained by this lack of cash flow. Real income growth for most people in most Anglo economies has been flat or negative for many years now. And I think one of the best things that could happen would be a pickup in wage growth. Now, I don't see this happening in Europe because unemployment is so high. But in the US where it is coming down and we're seeing a clear uh, pickup in, um, in the number of firms who are reporting difficulty in filling job openings that they just can't hire the people for, I think we will eventually start to see a pickup in wages and hopefully that will set up a, a virtual a circle, if you like, on the consumer side. But this uh, treating people to the uh, very badly with on the wage front and, and the contract front is really very unhelpful, both in a micro and a macro uh, sphere. And um, you know, I'd very much like to see government action uh, to, to change it. I think it's extremely unlikely in the US, though it does look like a political head of steam is building in the UK, where I think people have been quite shocked to find out just how widespread these zero hour contracts actually are. President Obama, uh, as you know, has been uh, on the road trying to uh, build or promote some kind of housing uh, recovery. But there's a real problem here, isn't there, uh, with young graduates unable to afford deposits to get on the housing ladder uh, because they have these huge student loans to pay off. So two points, really, to address here. Uh, the housing market and the ticking student loan time bombs. With the e economy growing at less than 2%, how can Obama deliver a better, a richer, a more comfortable middle class? Well, he can't. With growth at 2%, that's pretty much impossible. Uh, it, it, growth needs to be 3% plus to even begin closing the output gap that was created by the Lehman failure and the crash that followed it. So we do need to see a clear acceleration in growth. Uh, and the housing market's a key part of that. And housing has been doing pretty well from an extraordinarily depressed base, of course. But the last couple of years have seen a real improvement in prices and in volumes. I'm a bit nervous looking forward over the next six months or so because we've had a clear rise in interest rates since the Fed told us it was planning on slowing down its policy accommodation later this year. Mortgage rates have gone up by about 1%. Doesn't sound like a huge amount, but when they were only 3.5, an increase to 4.5 is quite a big hit. And we've seen house builder share prices falling, housing construction starting to fall. So it does make me nervous about the, the near term. I've got to say, in the medium term, the outlook is quite favourable because we have half a generation of people who normally would have bought houses who haven't. But as the banking system eases up the credit conditions for getting a mortgage and down payments start to come down, deposit requirements are reduced, we will see a more sustained recovery. But you're right, there's a huge number of people who are very constrained by their student loan debt, people who took on that debt in the expectation that acquiring right. a degree or a second and degree no. would put them into a higher paying job and finding that those jobs aren't available. Exactly. Those people are going to be stuck with that debt for a very long time but without the cash flow that they thought that would come with it. And okay. They're going to be left behind. All right, Ian, we'll leave it there. Ian Shepherdson of Pantheon Macroeconomics. Thanks for joining us. And that's how the global business world looks this week. But there's more, much more for you online at aljazeera.com slash business, the latest business headlines, plus all of our previous episodes for you to catch up on. And then to get in touch, drop us an email, countingthecost at aljazeera.net. That's our address.
But that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Stephen Cole from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.